Welcome to Money on Tap. Money on Tap, your personal finance headquarters, where we bring out the professionals' experience and some fun in what we call three-dimensional investing, utilizing insurance, brokerage, and fee-based planning. That's what we do on this show. We look at all sides of the issues, and we bring a fully independent planning perspective to the table. Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap. Tap. We are so glad to have you on board with us today. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. We've got a loaded show for you today. We're going to be talking about 12 things you need to know before buying stocks. Uh, there's a there's a lot of activity out there. There's a lot to talk about, but we want to get back to some of the basics and give to you or impart to you some wisdom about the market, what it is, how you could be engaged, how potentially this is not your time to be jumping in or doing something right now. Either way, we're going to give to you 12 things that are important for you to pay attention to. I'm Seth Crossman, And I'm Ben Brayshaw. This is Money on Tap. And if you're new to us, welcome. If you're a return, welcome. And uh, we want to thank all the people out there that have been calling up lately, uh, bringing not only you know topics to the show for us, things that we love to have conversations around, but also asking us the questions that are important for them and their personal finance to help them make the right decisions for themselves today for the next 10, 20 years. That's right, Seth. That's us. Hey, you forgot one one of our listeners. We've got the new, we've got the return, and we got the fans. we got the fans page. <laughs> so welcome to you fans as well. Seth just kind of overlooks those. Bum, bum. That was the bus right there, backing <laughs> over me and driving off again. Uh, so... <laughs> I'm going to give you a hard time today, Seth. It's all, <laughs> it's going to be a good one. I'm going to ignore what I just heard. There, <laughs> there's something that's more important than, than Ben uh, backing the bus over me today, folks. This is, this is actually really valuable for you. If you are looking for resources, if you're trying to find help, if you have something out there that you're kind of working through or a conversation that you're having at the dinner table, we have got so many resources for you on our website they're free to you. So one of the things that I wanted to bring to the table today is a resource for you, uh, wherever you're at, if you're having those dinner table, coffee table conversations. Or Zoom conversations, Seth. People aren't getting together at the coffee table. I don't know what, well, I mean, I don't know what you're doing for social distancing, but well, that's... You a... know what? With my own family, <laughs> doggone it, <laughs> I am not going to Zoom call. <laughs> but hey, they're all doing it, and you might be one of those people that should do or want to do it too. Anyways, this is uh, our website. It's BrayshawFinancial.com. B is in Bravo. R-A-Y. S is in Sierra. H-A-W. Financial.com. That's the name of our company too. And uh, it just happens to be Ben's last name. Uh, <laughs> it worked out like that. I don't know how <laughs> that happened. <laughs> it's a strange, strange scenario there, Seth. Hey, we've got a lot of resources there. A lot. I mean, we really focus on uh, with our clients trying to get the. I mean, the the, the best of technology, the best of the most um, up to date information available, and a ton of things that you topics that you might be having, conversations that you might have be having, videos that you uh, can just grab a hold of and really start to dig into. What's of in, uh, importance to you? And uh, next step, have a conversation. Give us a call. Yeah, that's one of the things, Seth. People people are scared to call, and I don't I don't blame them. There's just so much out there, and there's so many questions. But we're going to talk a little bit about that today, and uh, I'm kind of excited about the show in a lot of ways because it's it's really relevant to what's going on because there's so much in between, back and forth. What should I do? Invest in stocks? Don't invest? Corona return? We got a lot of stuff coming up, folks. Next, we have money in the news. Are you looking to buy a house? Are you looking to refinance a house? Low mortgage rates are stoking the housing market's recovery from the coronavirus, but there may be limits to how much of a boost they will give. This brought to you by Market Watch Jacob Passy. And uh, gosh, you know, we've got a lot of friends in the industry, and it is 
really an interesting time, uh, depending on where you're at. I mean, you could have very low inventory in the housing market right now, exacerbated by super low rates and everybody trying to grab up and snap up real estate. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Seth, the, the whole marketplace is crazy because, you know, now that interest rates are even lower than ever, um, it's really, I mean, I mean, houses are flying off the shelves. People can, they, they can afford more home for more money. So um, they're paying less in interest. So, you know, I always tell people, it's like, if you can afford, you know, $1,500 a month in a mortgage and 500 of that was expected to be, you know, interest and 1,000 was principal, well, you know, if the interest rate goes down, well, then, you know, you can, you still can afford only 1500 but the value of your home goes up because the principal is based on that in, innate price of the house. So it's just kind of an interesting piece, but it's also made people say, hey, you know what, I'm going to buckle down for 30 years. Like, why not? Or 15. Yeah, I mean, it's just crazy. And then, and then on top of it, we have this massive exit from the cities. I mean, I don't know about on the West Coast, Seth, but we have people renting homes to people who are in the cities. I have friends who have rented their homes for major money, for at least New England money, um, for people getting out of New York City and New Jersey and Connecticut. And, and that's been pretty phenomenal. But then on top of it, the the home purchases from out of state at the you know kind of work from home mentality, someone's saying, I can do this job for my house and my house does not need to be in Connecticut or New York. I have no idea why people would want to get out of the city now. <laughs> Such a great place. Every time I drive in, I, I look to my left, I look to my right, and this is exactly where I wanted. I want to plant my family, right? Yeah, you know, I, I it's not me, and it's not you, clearly, and that's okay. But there's people that just love city life. My sister, you know, yeah. left. We grew up on a farm, and my sister left that life and, and loves the city. I mean, loves the city. So that's pretty. Yeah. That's pretty phenomenal. And but these housing rates, uh, mortgage rates are are phenomenal. I mean, it's just I, I've talked to mortgage brokers, and they are literally buried with work. They just cannot. They can. They cannot do enough to get these things done and closed on time. It, it's it's crazy. Yeah, uh, intro line to the to the article says mortgage rates have fallen to an all time low. Okay, but here's the kicker: for a fourth time this year, in in six months, <laughs> we've seen this just bounce across the bar- the bottom. Uh, average thirty year uh, rate on a mortgage is three point one three. On a fifteen year, and this is a fixed, and on a fifteen year, it's two point five eight. Well, that's interesting because you know I think this is the straight rate. And, yeah. you know, cause I, I haven't, never what you, it's not what you're going to get. I yeah. mean, I haven't heard anybody get less than three and a half on a 30 year fixed. So if you're getting three and a half, that's pretty solid. And honestly, the fed is saying, they got a go, guy. they're not going, they're not getting, yeah, you've got a guy, <laughs> I got a guy, you've got a guy, we all got guys, but you know, three and a half seems to be pretty standard. If you're going to, if you get anything better than three and a half right now, uh, you know, that for 30 year fixed, that's, that's phenomenal from anything I've heard. So, um, mm-hmm. but borrowing money at this time, period may not be possible for some people who are out of a job. I mean, yeah. there's, you know, whatever, 20 million some odd Americans that are out of a job that have no chance of refinancing uh, on these low rates, mm-hmm. you know? And so that's one of the things that's a little crazy. I, I wish there was an incentive for banks to restructure loans that are currently on the books to create less default. Yeah. I, and I have seen some of that. I've, I've, I think Wells Fargo is one of the, the, yeah. major mortgage lenders out there that was doing some of that activity out there. Yeah. So uh, this is a, a bit of a, a, a contrarian, right? The contrarian po- point of view on what's going on out there. And uh, believe it or not, we're going to grab this one from CNN today. And uh, cause that's where we get most of our news, right? Is <laughs> <laughs> headline here <laughs> by Matt Egan. 190 oil sounds crazy. $190 J- oil, Seth. $190 oil sounds crazy. But JP Morgan thinks it's possible even after the pandemic. Now, Seth, you know I've been chatting about this a little bit here and there about the irony of oil for a while. The fact that JP Morgan's mm. publicizing is kind of a little unique. I didn't, I don't, I didn't have $190 oil, but I was definitely thinking triple digits, which is funny because, um, a lot of people know that I, I'm, I'm, I really am an energy investor. That's that's a lot of what I look at and so forth. So, um, 
But this article is really interesting. So there's, you know, if you can recall, if any of our listeners remember, you know, the kind of U.S. crude oil crash below zero back in April, we bottomed at a negative $40 a barrel. It's so hard to remember that far back. The futures. <laughs> There's the futures, been so much news. <laughs> the futures. The futures have dropped. were dropped all the way down to forty dollars a barrel. So if you owned a futures contract and you were expiring, the legitimacy was that you know one futures contract was a thousand barrels of oil. You would have to show up. They'll pay you. They would pay you forty dollars a barrel. But you would have to show up with your thousand barrels, and there was all those jokes about <laughs> who's going to, how are you going to even get the thousand barrels because there's none for sale; they're all full. So yeah. it's just kind of interesting. So that goes below forty. It's it's fully recovered. I mean, we almost had a a full swing back to forty here, and so we went from negative forty to forty. But they're talking about the fact that you know it. it it's easy to sh- it, it's easy to turn on oil and and so forth, but when you start shutting off oil, that's a whole different issue. And creating oil or trying to create more oil becomes more and more costly. So, what's interesting is a lot of the ex- exploration work or advancement to continue creating more oil, even though we have these huge reserves that are full, has been slowed and stopped. And that's not something that's just easy to turn that process back on. Like, oh, go drill a well. Well, that takes time before they actually get the oil out. So it's just interesting that the, the supply cuts that we've done and what's, what's forced the oil industry to do to address those supply cuts may be a backlash to us as our oil demands continue to start rising. And I was saying to somebody, we may have an oil shortage, I even said. And I think that's what J.B. Morgan is actually suggesting could happen. And I, I really think it's interesting. I mean, I, I wouldn't say I would just start dropping money into, you know, oil ETFs or anything like that. But this is just a really very interesting article because as we grow in our demand for oil, the de, you know, the fact that there's less produced, there's going to be a concern of like, can they start keeping up with demand and turning stuff back on? But there's not really a huge desire for a lot of con- countries to turn on oil because you have Saudi Arabia who needs $80 barrel oil. You took all my bullets stuck on it. <laughs> I'm just going to I'm just going to say that tw- this is a price target for 2022 and I'm that's it. I got thanks Ben. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> well, you well, know, with that I'm going to I'm, I'm going to I'm going to bring in the next article if you got any unless you you've got five more bullets that you're hanging on to out there that I'm, I'm just not I'm aware. just hanging on this article. This is just so interesting because there's just so I mean, I'm looking at. There's no reason for there's no there's not a lot of reasons for oil companies even to you know push more oil out because their their real profit levels are between sixty and eighty dollars a barrel, which is like I would I would guess that's like four or five bucks a gallon for us at the gasoline pump, you know. Well, we've been there before. Yeah, and they want to be back uh, there. I, I haven't been at a five dollar per gallon um but we've been pretty much we've been at that four dollars yeah right below i i I don't mind at the moment i'm pretty darn happy with my two dollars and 45 cents i'm paying at the at the tank i don't know what you guys got going on over there yeah no it's it's um it's a little lower than that actually the other day but yeah about that so hey let's talk about uh let's talk about when gas used to be 69 cents a gallon good old uh 2000 days in in Virginia the 2099 yeah i remember <laughs> i remember it was like yeah 76 cents and i mean crazy if, dollar 72 if you're cents. driving a 1970 Chevy Bel Air you are you got it and, made and you, and you were back then seth believe it or not yeah yeah that was that was my home i lived in that car <laughs> <laughs> no that was a fantastic car well next up is I got this. I got this. We're going to talk about your, you, you're never going to believe it, folks, what we've got coming to you next. We're going to talk about the coronavirus. Why would we talk about the coronavirus? <laughs> because everywhere, everywhere we look, there's, there's a lot of news going on right now. Right now, the big one is this fearing the second wave of coronavirus. What is happening in the, the world and it, right now in your backyard as far as the uh, the infection rate, uh, you know, the deaths that are happening in the news and the second wave that's being reported on. 
and uh, and there's there's some real fear around it. And there's also you know some other the flip side of that too is people are promoting you know different kinds of stay at home investing and what to do with your money in that situation. Yeah, there's there's definitely a lot on you know, stay at home stocks, stay at home ETFs and what those, you know, what technologies people are using. And I think that's, you know, been for that huge, the huge rally we've had, we've seen in the NASDAQ, which, you know, has hit record highs in the last week or two. And, you know, we're just, we're just cusping on the, on the, the, the 5G that's coming through. There's just so much technology in front of us that is just driving it. And, and honestly, I got to tell you, Seth, I mean, this stay at home order and the coronavirus and stuff like that, it definitely slowed life a lot. I don't know about you, but I actually liked it a lot. It wasn't we weren't racing around to sporting events or this, that, or the other thing. Life slowed down. <laughs> well, if you yeah, if you have kids involved in sports and they just said, Well, you don't go do that now, it it put a whole lot of time back on our plate, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. A lot of fighting for the kids, but but still good. Still good. And uh but, you know, this coronavirus, there's a lot of conversation in, in, in the news. And, and I'm referencing an article here um, that I found on Yahoo Finance, uh, fearing the second wave of coronavirus, bet on stay-at-home ETFs. This is by... Uh, Suida Jeswal. Yeah. They talk about how there's a lot of stuff going on and fears of, you know, you're hearing record reports of growth in certain states and high counts. I, I've heard numbers like 40% up. And there really is a concern, and, and, and it's a legitimate concern to say, "Hey, what's going to happen?" And are, you know, now that we've opened up, I mean, we've seen we've seen lots of potential exposure and spread with the rioting and all the stuff that's happened. We've we've seen all of that stuff, and is that part of this? I don't know. You know, the, the rallies, the, the you know, the, with President Trump. I mean, you know, are all these things going to overwhelm our society, and we're just maybe weeks away from seeing the outcome of that? Well. As of uh, June 17th, there were 25,500 new corona cases in the U.S., and on that day, there was a death toll of uh, 755 people in the entire United States for corona, which is sad. Um, And and I keep hearing about the increase. Now, I, I actually did some reverse Google searching, Seth, which I had mentioned to you that I wanted to see how that compared to the worst day in New York. Um, And I was actually surprised that... You know, here this June seventeenth, U.S. You know, U.S. wide, there were seven hundred and fifty-five people that passed away. But on the worst day in New York, seven hundred and thirty people had died. I found that on U.S. News and World Reports, and that was interesting. And that was when they um, they brought their death toll up to over fifty-four hundred. I, I don't know what day that was, but that was their highest day. It just it's kind of scary when you really think about it. Or that's at least what the article says. New York experiences highest single day death toll. It's it's really it's really bad, but I at the same time, if I'm looking at a U.S. number that's basically the same as what New York had on a real high day, I'm not I'm not really seeing maybe the crux of a second coronavirus wave shutting us down or something again, not yet at least. Yeah, I think a couple of factors out there that are were noteworthy that we've been you know, paying attention to and listening to some different people around is uh, the fact that we do have testing now. That was one of the biggest concerns initially was getting testing with the amount of testing that's being done is there's a, there's a higher reporting that's happening. Um, And the other, the other part of this is, is um, we, we now have a greater understanding around who's susceptible here. And if you're under the age of 54, you have such a small, tiny, minute possibility of contracting and not uh, recovering from this. Right. And it really is that population over the age of 75 plus that, that is very susceptible to, um, you know, death being an, an outcome. And, and largely we're protecting and trying to do, put into place the pieces that need to be there to protect that population. So that's, those are the things that we see going on. And I like that the, that the numbers are speaking to something totally different than what under the hood of what was being reported on to us. And I think that's important to note. Yeah, New York yeah. is doing great. They're rolling back out. Uh, yeah. You know, the restaurants are opening up. They're doing, um, uh, I mean, which has been the epicenter of a lot of the activity there. So we're seeing a, a, a population getting back to life. It's vital. Yeah, I, I think I think from an investment standpoint, you know, there's there's clearly a lot of good signs that things are moving forward. I, I think you know from an, an investment focus, what's really interesting about this and the debate set that everyone has, and, and you and I have it internally, and we've talked with our other partners about it too. It's just, hey, 
are we are we gung ho stay at home focus on stay at home stocks or are we going to see a retreat in those because people are just going to zip right back to normal or some version of normal more than we ever thought before yeah jumping on the bandwagon with some of these ideas is super um uh not a safe model it's really yeah i i don't think a risky approach yeah i don't think right now is the hey i'm going to be jumping on all the etfs that are for stay at home long term because i haven't met a lot of people who say hey really i'm going to stay at home forever i've met people that say i'm going to work from home i i'm i'm going to continue working from home because i like it and i want to get out of the city and there's going to be a, a large percentage of that, but that's not like half of America, okay? Um, and But that doesn't mean that they're going to stop going to restaurants and stores. So a couple of the things that are that the article covers here is, is are, are ideas that that we're behind and we've been using and, and picking up and buying along the way. And it's one, the mindset here that comes to the front for me is, did you like it before? Was it good then? Is it good now? Uh, cause I'd have to say, yes, if you're looking at cloud computing, was that an idea that we were on board with before? Absolutely. Just the trend in technology today says, yeah, there's going to be a lot more cloud computing going on. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think this is, I mean, we got 5g coming, we got all sorts of crazy rock star kind of stuff in our technology world. It is expanding our globe or actually it said, said, say the technology is really shrinking our globe. Um, Quite a bit, but I, I mean, at the end of the day, it's it's a it's a complicated process to say that you know well we're getting out of technology. That's just not happening. Technology is a growing, growing demand. That's going to do it for us. Uh, money in the news. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at eight five five two two six eight five five one or info at yourmoneyontap dot com. Hi, my name is Ben Brayshaw, one of the co-hosts of Money on Tap. If you have questions when it comes to your retirement and are looking for a personalized solution, contact us at Brayshaw Financial Group. In today's volatile stock market, we can help you plan to find your successful retirement solution. Am I saving enough? Am I saving into the right places? Do my investments match my appetite for risk? Do I have a tax strategy that is going to help me keep more of what I earn? How can I maximize my Social Security income? If you are like most people, you are getting closer and closer to your retirement and may be wondering if you're taking the right steps. If you're in retirement, you may be wondering, am I maximizing my income while preserving my estate and caring for my family? We talk about all things financial in what we call three-dimensional investing, putting a plan around your financial future. If you feel that now is the time to start getting the answers to some of these questions for your own situation, give us a call at Brayshaw Financial Group at 855-226-8551. Headquartered in Bedford, New Hampshire, we have offices throughout New England and across the country. We would love the opportunity to show you how we can help. There's absolutely no cost or obligation just to meet with us, and we welcome you to our office. Call us at 855-226-8551. Now back to Money on Tap with Ben and Seth. Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. I'm Seth Crespin. And I'm Ben Brayshaw. And uh, today we promised you a loaded show, a packed show. Seth, I got to tell you, like, there's a lot of people looking to listen to what we've got to say on this. And if if you're new to our show, these are going to be some things you can be real takeaways for you. That's one thing we really try to give back is is some stuff that you should just take into consideration as as you're looking at investing, whether you're new to investments or not. But um, if you're if you're new, you're not new. The twelve things we're going to talk about today about invest, you know, investing in stocks and things to be aware of or what to do um, may just may just help you. Even even some of the small tidbits of things. And you know what's funny is a couple of good reminders for me. Just a little silly stuff. I was just thinking about some of the stuff, and I, you know, we're going to get through this, but. Um, it's always a good reminder to kind of check your rules, check the rules, and make sure you're abiding by your own rules. You know, I, I thought you know, that show we did a few weeks ago about, uh, it was a month ago, on Warren Buffett breaking his own rules. Don't break your rules if you're solid on them. That's usually where it works. So, There was a reason that you put them into place right, in the first place, and it was... Uh, Probably to keep you out of the emotional side that can happen when you're going in and, and working in the markets and trying to work with your own finances. I mean, it's hard to not be emotionally tied. Uh, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Uh, you know, there was there was something really uh, eye-opening this this week. 
that happened. And uh, that was some of the saddest news that I've had come across my desk in this last year. And that was about a 20 year old Alexander Kearns that um, he actually took his own life this last week uh, as a result of doing some leveraged buying in his Robin hood account. And we're not trying to say that that in any way that this is a, anyone's at fault here other than we're just trying to recognize that, that there's some real risk. And this is the, 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 the worst of it that I've seen is somebody seeing their account go into a negative balance of over $700,000 and not, not understanding what that was or why. And, um, and ultimately making, making that decision. Yeah, that's, you know, that's, it's tragic. It's tragic. And there's a lot of issues around that, whether or not he even had that huge loss balance. And I've read the articles and it might be a technical glitch and stuff like that. And it obviously set off a a mainstream issue for him. So our, our thoughts and prayers go out to the family, but I mean, the fact that you're doing it alone, that, that there's some real serious you know, consequences sometimes that you can have that might be real or not even real and you don't understand what's going on. And, and that's where, you know, why we kind of bring these shows. So it's kind of ironic that that had happened and this was our show plan idea um, in the same time period. So that's just a kind of a sad connection, but um, really hope that that family um, can recover from that. Uh, but, you know, number one, Seth, I think, you know, what we came up with was, um, the number one thing you want to do before you invest in stocks is make sure you paid off your debt. Okay. I meet people all the time who are, you know, want to say, Hey, I really want to buy some stocks. And we get out of the crux of it. They might have some money, but they've never paid off their credit cards. They just have revolving credit card lines at, you know, 15, 20% interest rates. And it's like, you know, having a realistic return perspective, 15, 20% a year, if you could do that would be great. You'd be one of the top investment people in the world if you could do that every year. So um, since that's not even the average of the market, that would show incredible gift. And, you know, since you're getting eaten away on the backside by your credit cards, you know, the first thing before you get invested in stock is make sure you're financially sound. That, that's that's number one. Number two, and it's going to be our recommendation from here on out, that um, you get professional help. Um, and I don't mean that in the way of... Uh, um, you might need professional help at the end of investing because it, it it does drive you nuts and crazy. But um, but we're talking about getting a financial advisor, getting somebody to be your sounding board, somebody that you can really just engage with and and just have some perspective outside the emotional scenarios that do happen and and and, and so forth. So, what do you think? I, I want to say how many how many times do we have the investor that that we're we're working with or a new client that we're working with and they've been doing it on their own. And they, they've gone into a place where they've lost so much money in, for whatever the circumstances might be, just, you know, missed trades or, you know, emotional decisions in the market. And they're so wrapped up in what they've done and how they've performed or underperformed that they can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And so getting unwound from that scenario, that's a, that takes a, I'm surprised that we don't get handed out some kind of a, a, a degree in that uh, psychology. <laughs> well, you know, it, at the people, end of the day, people don't come to us because, and, and, and we have had people come to us who just came into a bunch of money for the first time. I've had that happen a number of times, and they need help, and they know they need help. But most people, they start out, you know, buying some, you know, Apple stock or something like that, and you know, ten years later, they've got some significant money and they're like, you know, I really got a lot of money here and I got this low cost basis and, you know, I don't know what to do and I'm making more money now and I'm saving and I really need some help. And that's usually how it is. And I mean, Seth, we've had people come through the door in the last couple of months who have, you know, large stock portfolios all over the place who they don't know what to do. They have no idea what to do. They've got, they've got losses here. They've got huge gains there. And I mean, in this market, just because the market was down, it got cr- basically crushed at one point. Uh, in March, doesn't mean that all the stocks were down. I mean, some companies were booming. So people who had diversified portfolios may not have been that bad off. And I have some people who have massive gains in major technology stocks, but now their portfolio is so unbalanced, but they don't know what to do. They don't know when to sell. I've had this stock. This is my winner. This is the one I want to keep. 
keep riding it, right? I, I can't get off this horse. This thing's my saving grace. Yeah. I mean, this not is realizing one, this is the one that works. Yeah. How do, how do you start unloading some of those profits and going back, going the rediversifying and getting into the, the places where you need to be to continue to keep the ship rising? Because one stock isn't going to, isn't going to cut it, folks. Yeah. So, so when people walk through the door, you, the first question I ask is, are you a long-term investor? Well, it depends on how you do. Because if, if I give you my money to, and, and, you, and you, you, don't see what, you don't do what I want you to, I'm a short-term investor, right? That's kind of the mindset that a lot of people have. But it's seeing the big picture and understanding those, those parts and pieces and how they work over time. That's the challenge, of course. Yeah. And I, I mean, so if, if someone's a long-term investor, then all of a sudden the question is, what's long-term? Right. Right. Is it three years, five years, 10 years? You know, those types of things are actually going to define a lot of what, you know, you might buy or we might be talking to you about buying is knowing what your time frame is and and looking at that as an approach to whether you're, you're entering the stock market. What does that mean? Are you buying stocks? Are you buying bonds? Are you buying ETFs or mutual funds or, you know, whatever that indice might be or I mean, what is right for you? And that, that really has a lot to do on your time horizon, as we call long-term investors. So, so evaluating your time horizon is huge. The challenge in that is understanding the risk and the risk that you're taking on inside of that, because most people's um, psychology around investments works in about a six-month window. So if you're a long-term investor, and you're, but your mind keeps pulling you into this six-month window, and you start having volatility happen in your portfolio, that's where so many people... Uh, run into trouble and get off track and, you know, ditch everything that they've been doing and try to, you know, cobble this thing back together the best they can, or they just walk away from it because it's too painful. So always have bring being brought back into that long-term mindset because everybody should be in the greater portion of what it is that they're trying to accomplish a long-term investor, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Seth, you're, you're right on there. We're going to get a little bit more into risk here in a minute, but, um, Number four we have is, you know, return in the market is more than just the value of the stock getting larger. For some people, um, and there's a lot of conversation about value investing and or dividends, you know, I mean, you can just buy a stock and potentially collect some sort of, you know, yield, but it might not be a growth stock. It might not be a stock that's, you know, going to go up in value. And, and so understanding, you know, hey, if you look at a chart, is that chart a, a chart that's flat? It doesn't have an upward trend, but maybe maybe it's not meant to be. And so you got to understand, and I, and I bring this up not because, hey, you should buy things that have dividends or not have dividends or, you know, but they, they have different purposes. And depending on the taxable or non-taxable side of the account may be relevant or irrelevant to what you purchase or have more relevancy. And, but honestly, you know, how a stock brings back value could be different based on how it's designed or meant to be functioning for you. Number five, don't try to time the market. Come on, Seth. And Come on. I want to time it. It's inevitable. At some point in time, you're going to buy. And at some point in time, you're going to sell, Right. So what are we saying when we say don't time the market? Well, if you take a look at history, right, in the market, and you see this market going up, 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 you know, people want to inevitably show you in a return scenario, well, here's the bottom and here's the top and here's the returns in between. But that's never how, an, that's never how people buy and sell the market. So you have to take that out of it and say, if you don't buy the bottom and you don't sell the top, what do you have over time? And that's the, that's what we're saying is that we're not trying to buy the bottom and sell the top. We're, I mean, it's a great idea, but that is what timing the market would be. But being invested over time, coming back into looking at what are those returns or potential expected returns that we've got history giving us, that's what we're trying to use to understand what the value is here and what you're buying over time. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. And I think I think the thing about, you know, trying not to time the market and so forth is I always tell people, you know, you're a participant. You are not the leader, you are not the creator, you are not going to you're not going to be the expect 
expert guru, you know, you're going to participate and you want to kind of participate in the low sides and participate selling in the upsides Um, and be happy with the gain you get just because when you sell it, it's going to continue to rise. When you buy it, it's going to continue to fall. It's, That'll eat your lunch if you let it, too. <laughs> it, it will. It's unbelievable. That's why I always tell people, take a position in something. Don't shove all your money in at once, okay? You know, that's that's really where it's at. Like, we'll we'll take a position in something, and then if we if, if, it, if it does drop down and we believe it has more value, we take a little more of a position. And we continue to what, do what we call as dollar cost average into an asset. And uh, sometimes we buy a stock or an asset or an ETF or whatever, and it does go up. We happen to be either on the upswing or we bought at the bottom r- randomly or very close to it. We're on the, you know, the, the growth side of it. It doesn't mean you're not going to continue to take a position. It may never hit that number again. You never know. But taking positions over repetitive periods of time has proven to give you a better average into an asset. And that's something we call dollar cost averaging. And we, we really encourage people to look at that. And if you are questioning what that is, and you're, you're, for instance, you have a 401k or some simple IRA, something that is being contributed to regularly, and you've you've got holdings in that, and you've got four mutual funds or ETFs or whatever you've got that that they've you know given you this to portfolio that you should go into because that's what a lot of the platforms will do. The thing here is is that you are dollar cost averaging. Right, because you're you're probably not trading in and out of the market with that. You just are continuing to kind of trickle in. You get a paycheck. A little bit goes into your investments. A little bit goes in. Well, hopefully, a lot of it goes into your pocket for the month. But yeah. that's a dollar cost average. And as we get here to number six, um, you know, Seth, you mentioned risk earlier, and I think I think that's probably you know we talk about time horizon, we talk about risk tolerance. You know, buying individual stocks is extremely risky. It's extremely risky. And we're going to come right back with that conversation in just a minute. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at info at yourmoneyontap.com at 855-226-8551. If you didn't get that number, it's 855-226-8551. We'll be right back with Understanding Your Risk. Hi, my name is Seth Crussman, partner with Brayshaw Financial Group and one of the co-hosts of Money on Tap. One of the biggest concerns and largest expenses people face today is taxes. Without thoughtful planning, taxes can destroy future retirement dollars, eliminating the possibility of a timely retirement or dreams of what you want retirement to look like. If you're like most people, you're getting closer and closer to retirement, and you may be wondering if you're taking the right steps. Will my income be enough? Will rising taxes force me to give up my dreams? How does inflation factor into all of this? These are real concerns and you're not alone. Putting a plan around your financial future is what we do. If you have questions when it comes to your financial security, and if you're looking for a personalized solution, contact us at Brayshaw Financial Group, 855-226-8551. It's time for you to start getting answers to your questions. Headquartered in Bedford, New Hampshire, Brayshaw Financial has offices across the country. We'd love the opportunity to show you how we can help. There's absolutely no cost or obligation to meet with us. Call us at 855-226-8551. 855-226-8551. Now back to Money on Tap with Ben and Seth. <laughs> Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. We are talking about things to know or do before investing in stocks. And if you are an investor and you're looking to understand a part that we're going to be speaking specifically about next, which is risk, what we would ask you to do is to, first of all, understand your own risk. And to get a picture of that, we've got a tool for you on our website. You can go to BrayshawFinancial.com. That's B as in Bravo, R-A-Y-S as in Sierra, H-A-W, Financial.com, or YourMoneyOnTap.com. Either way, right there, we've got a resource for you. And if you scroll down to the, the middle of the page, they'll say, what's your risk? Or you can go to the top right and look at the resources. It's there for you as well. 
all you, you can upload your portfolio that you have right now. It'll tell you what that risk is. You can take a quick little survey of uh, a two minute questionnaire that will tell you what your risk is and aligning those two things for you is really important because we don't want you to sell out of the market at a critical time and uh, completely walk away from the plan that's designed to, to ultimately get you where you want to go. Yeah, you know, I think the thing about risk, Seth, is that people don't really understand the risk that they actually are buying most of the time, if not all the time. Um, but stocks specifically um, come with an exorbitant amount of risk. And, you know, I, I think the thing that people hear is, you know, I'm going to buy this stock or I'm going to buy that stock. And honestly, you, I hear people put their money in individual stocks. We talked about the young man who took his own life. I mean, people make huge mistakes and lose lots of money. There was a there was an investor, a young investor, what was it, in Italy or something, Seth, that recently mm-hmm. just put all their money in a in a in a leveraged investment and it just tanked. It was a lost. coffee company. The coffee yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Was it was it Luckin? Was it I think it was yeah. Luckin Coffee. Uh-huh. Yeah. And you know, there's fraud and all that stuff that happened. So there's, you know, hey, you put that's why you diversify. You know, and and Buyer beware. Watch out for the neighbor who has a stock tip. By the time that your neighbor is your financial advisor, that stock has probably already moved. Okay, and in in and in, buyer beware number two. Watch out for penny stocks. Those are the stocks under five bucks that you know are highly volatile. You could be on the end of you know somebody trying to make a market or something like that, and just you know, trying to take advantage of you know unsavvy investors. And then, I want to I want to say something about that. This is what that looks like on the front end, and you, and you can be at a reputable site too, and they'll tell you, "Hey, this guy picked the, um, you know, he picked the the two thousand eight uh, tranche of the S and P five hundred, the financial crisis, and he's told us the last three financial collapses, or you know, he's picked the last, uh, he picked Netflix before Netflix was a thing. You know what I mean? That's like you'll see these headlines, and then they want you to sign up for their newsletter or pay for a subscribe or whatever. A lot of the time, those those are, that's a penny stock ploy. Yeah, and I always tell people number three is you know watch out for options. Just steer clear. If you don't even know what it is, you don't. If, if you know anything about it, you know people have lost a ton of money in them. Um, don't touch options, okay? I mean, if you're if you're new to investing on any level, that shouldn't even be part of your story for five or ten or fifteen years, and you get training, and it's just not part of every day. You, you need a, a financial advisor to look at that. So number seven. We're moving on here, folks. Number seven, new investors might want to consider investments that uh, incorporate large diversity, such as index funds, mutual funds, or ETFs, instead of individual stocks. And here's why. So what is that? That the individual stock is, first of all, you're buying solely one company, right? That's what a stock is, is you're buying into the company and uh, you're a, you're a, a part owner then in that company. You, 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 can you go in there and wave your stock around and say, Hey, I'm here. I own the company. No, that's not what we're saying. We're saying you do have voting rights and there are some other privileges that come along with that, but you're buying in that, that company to uh, uh, ultimately looking for that to grow and to increase and improve over time. So instead of just buying one company <clears throat> long, long time ago, what they developed was what's called a mutual fund. And that's a basket of companies and bonds and other vehicles in there as well. And then they transferred that idea into something called an ETF, which uh, it ultimately kind of has about that same idea, a basket of stocks, a whole bunch of stuff in there. But it just trades basically on a daily basis, kind of like it, like a stock does. So without getting into details of, of all of what those things are, potentially what could happen is that you could get far more diversified just by picking up one thing versus having to go out and buy Take, for instance, the S&P 500. That's an index out there. Well, what would you have to buy? How much money would you have to have to just try to create an S&P 500 index in your portfolio? That's a lot of money. So instead of doing that, you could go ahead and try to pick up a fund that basically mirrors that idea. Yeah, you know, I mean, the thing is, is that if you don't have, if you don't have the the financial ability to create diversity, which is number eight here, um, and looking at you know twenty to thirty different stock holdings at various industries to expand your ability to you know 
have exposure to different areas of the market, which ultimately will create the diversity you need, which will help reduce your risk, not entirely get rid of your risk. Yeah, with with that, I'm I, I just wanted to say, Ben, that you know that uh, that penny stock idea, the neighbor that's bringing you stock tips. I've heard so many people have that same conversation and throw in a mutual fund or throw in some kind of an ETF and, you know, or my gosh, these leveraged ETFs are out there as well and just lose it all as well. And so it's not a, it's, this is something we're saying this, but it's not, this is not an equation of safety, right? It's, it is knowing better. It's, it's potentially a better option than just picking up that single stock idea, but this is not an equation of this equals safety. Yeah, no, exactly. And, you know, I honestly would tell you that, you know, it's not just going to be buying 20 or 30 stocks. I think you're going to be buying 20 or 30 different types of investments, if not investments that have their own internal diversity, uh, ETFs or mutual funds or whatever, that you're going to spread out and try to offset one risk versus the other. You know, when technology goes up and industrials are going down uh, or healthcare is going up and, you know, consumer retail is going down. I mean, you kind of have, you, you kind of want to balance some of the different things because we just don't know what's always going to happen. We don't know when the next pandemic is going to hit America. That's just a real huge unknown. Number nine, don't be greedy. Expect realistic returns. Uh, I love the saying, don't try to be happier than happy. Okay. Hey, this is Money on Tap. We're going to take a quick break. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. When we get back, you're going to hear the last three of the 12 things to know or do before investing in stocks. A lengthy vacation requires some thoughtful and detailed planning, and few people would go on such a trip without the necessary preparation. On our Cliff Notes edition of Money on Tap, Seth Crossman shows us with his example that the same care and thoughtfulness should also be given to our retirement planning. This is a journey. This is a project that you have an opportunity to invest in and to uncover and identify how you want to live your life. And I think how many times, you know, we go on vacation. A great friend of mine took his whole family on a mission trip to Guatemala this last year, Mm -hmm. and that looked like a tremendous adventure. And how much planning does it take? to get that to happen. I have no problem involving myself in creating a plan around something like that. And if I can get my mindset to be thinking that way, like, wow, I am planning the largest vacation of my life. How much fun can that be? And I can't wait to sit down and talk to you about that, right? Thanks for joining us for this Cliff Notes edition of Money on Tap with great tips from the pros in three-dimensional investing utilizing insurance, brokerage, and fee-based planning. Now back to Money on Tap with Ben and Seth. Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. Today, we are finishing up, the, the landing the ship here with us today. Uh, the last three of things that you need to know before investing in stocks. Ben, would you take it from here, please? You know, we we're just talking about, you know, don't be greedy. Expect realistic returns, okay? This is important because you have to kind of have an idea of what you want to get out of a stock, how long you want to own it, what do you believe its long-term outcome is going to be, and reevaluate that every 6 to 12 months because you should be a long-term investor. Don't just move on the wave of something small that happens, Um I I honestly, people are like, oh, it's up to this. Well, that was more than I ever expected. Well, then you should have sold it, right? I mean, that's that's really where it's at. I mean, if you had a huge gainer because you didn't really expect it, I'll tell people, listen, if you still want to stay in the stock, just take take your if if you doubled your money. If I mean, I meet people all the time. I bought the stock, you know, whatever years ago, and I doubled my money. It's like, oh wow, that's great. Well, take your principal off the table and use that money to. To maybe buy another big gainer, who knows? You know, but that's the way you have to do it. Well, I'm going to pay taxes. Well, we'll get there on that one. But number ten, as we round out these last three here, number ten is minimize and realize and understand your fees. So, if you're on these online trading platforms right now, or or, or just coming out with zero fees, zero fee trading costs, and it's a super competitive marketplace. And that's one thing to be aware of is that there's lots of different ways that fees can get assessed. And especially if you're out there doing it yourself, 
really taking a look at that and understanding what are you, what is a trading cost? What is a, what is the cost of the investment under the hood? Cause those carry potentially their own costs as well. Uh, and that can eat up some of the returns when working with an advisor, you know, make sure that you understand what are the fees? What are you paying for? Why would you work with Ben and Seth and, 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 and pay us to, to help you do uh, what we're doing in the planning piece? So understanding those fees is, is critical and important. Number 11, this is one of, we see this all the time. Don't become attached. Do not become attached. Emotions and emotional holdings uh, or holding onto a stock is unhealthy. And uh, one example I would bring to the table was my, my grandfather worked for John Deere. And, um, and boy, they just bought a ton of John Deere stock. And that wound up kind of being handed over and uh, it, 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 in transition of their life and to, you know, my parents and, and my aunt. And, uh, but those were pieces that were significant holdings and understandable that they wanted to hold on to a piece of that legacy. Uh, it, it meant a lot to them. But at the same time, after a while, it held them back from really getting where they needed to go. You know, Seth, you're right. I mean, I, I meet people, and this just happens all the time. It's, it's amazing, actually, to me how many people this does happen to. And it has to do with the fact that they, they get a stock, and it's, it's a part of, or they believe it to be a part of their family. Like, you know, they inherited it from dad or mom, and, you know, dad bought this stock, and it's always, it's always held true and, and so forth. I'm sure, I, with almost certainty, that when your dad or mom bought that stock, they never had the emotional attachment you've now attributed to it. Um, and it, it's just not, no, nobody does when they buy a stock. It's like if I bought Apple stock and passed it on to my kids, I'd be like, <laughs> if you made a ton of money and Apple's in problems or there's an issue or you think you need to diversify, sell the stupid thing. I could care less. And I'm sure that's how most parents who hand off stock to their kids would probably think. But we do place a lot of emotional connection or attachment to stocks that, that just don't really make any sense. Yeah, this is not the family farm that's been in the in your family for generations and need to keep it going, right? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So number 12, taxes. We love taxes. Uh, well, <laughs> it's important for you to understand and, and to know what's your tax liability because there's potentially going to be some taxes if you have some gains, especially, you know, we're talking non-qualified or, you know, taxable accounts. You know, if you sell that stock and you've got a bunch of gains in there and it's going to be different for the long-term hold versus the short-term hold and knowing what it is that you're selling when you're selling is going to make a big difference because tax man's going to come around the end of the year and say, give me mine. Yeah, exactly. Taxes are something to consider, understand, and work with a professional on really trying to figure out how to do that because it's not, I tell people all the time, you know, if you're in a 40% tax bracket and you can make 7% before taxes or 5% after taxes, which one do you want? Well, obviously you want the 5% because if you had 7% and you lost 40% of it to taxes, well, that's less than a 5% return after tax. And you need to understand that and how it's going to impact you. And and I've had conversations recently with clients and some who have, you know, made some money in some, you know, random stocks that have risen right now. And I'm like, hey, you know, selling right now doesn't make sense because you're in an ordinary income tax bracket that's pretty high and you haven't owned the stock the 12 months to get the long-term cap gains rate. And so you're going to pay ordinary income tax on that gain. And and honestly, I, I think the stock could be a long-term hold. If anything, even if it stays the same value, though we take a risk, it could drop. Uh, even if it stays the same value, you're going to actually make more money just by holding it. And that could be 10, 15% return in tax savings. So, you know, just by holding it for the 12 months and going from short-term gain to long-term gain. And that's that's a whole conversation you need to have. And I find that a lot of first-time investors go out and they make some money and they sell it. And it could be a long-term hold, and they just have to be patient. But people are not patient when it comes to stocks. And when it comes to your own money, you're not patient because you don't want to lose it, but you want to make it. And you just it just becomes an overwhelming process. So rule of thumb, ordinary income taxes is not your friend. Just remember that. That's for sure. <laughs> Thank you. You've been listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. You can also find us at Facebook. We're at backslash 3D investing. We're also on Twitter at BFG underscore LLC. 
And as always, you can also find us at yourmoneyontap.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for liking our podcast. We appreciate you. And we can't wait to make it a great day and a great life with you here at Money on Tap. The views expressed are not necessarily the opinion of this radio station and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities mentioned herein. Investing is subject to risks, including loss of principal invested. No strategy, product, material, or tool mentioned can assure a profit nor protect against loss. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information, products, materials, or tools mentioned should be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. This show may be subsidized in whole or in part by a product sponsor or issuer. Securities and advisory services offered through Sage Point Financial Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC, and a registered investment advisor. All other services offered through Brayshaw Financial Group LLC are independent of Sage Point Financial. Sage Point Financial and Brayshaw Financial Group do not provide tax or legal advice. Main office is located at 116 South River Road, Bedford, New Hampshire. 03110 and can be reached at toll free 855 226 8551. Well, bye.